Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dale Caldwell, your host for Family Business Friday. And uh, we are honored to have a, um, um, someone who's becoming a friend, and I'm, I'm getting to know Miguel Lloyd, owner and CEO of Lloyd Media Group. We have become national on this call. Uh, Miguel um, is based in Atlanta. How are you doing this morning? I'm well, sir. How are you? Good, 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 good. Looking forward to your presentation. And uh, we're going to talk about marketing. And so as we're starting to reopen, you'll see from some of my slides from the governor, we are moving rapidly soon. In the next few weeks, we're going to open up fully or close to fully. Um, I'm saying that it'll be the new normal with a mask. So, so how do you market in this new environment? How do you move forward? So, so we're going to learn a lot today. Uh, but let me go through, as I always do, I introduce people to the Institute and kind of set the stage as to where we are. So one, for those that don't know us, where our mission is to support, promote, and research entrepreneurship with a special focus on family and veteran businesses. Um, we wouldn't exist without our sponsors, the TD Bank Charitable Foundation, Provident Bank, SunTrust, um, which will soon be known as, as Truist, CIA and J are our main, uh, our main sponsors, and we have a lot of, a lot of supporters. Our programs include our student entrepreneurship programs that we've been doing for 30 years. We're part of, uh, we have something called FDU Pitch and then part of the state university pitch where we help budding entrepreneurs develop business plans and, and possibly get some funding for their business plans. We have a family business alliance. Again, it's been around about 30 years where we work collect directly with family businesses to help them with coaching as well as some informative sessions as well as mentoring and consulting. We have the Family Business Awards. This year will be our 28th uh, Family Business Awards. So we're, we're excited about that, where we honor the best family businesses in New Jersey. Uh, we have a program called Veterans Launching Ventures, which uh, um, we're, uh, is going on now. It's a national program uh, that goes on about four times a year, where we help veterans or, or immediate family members of veterans develop a business plan uh, so that they can become entrepreneurs. And we have a small business series in which we have some amazing uh, speakers. That's been around about five, uh, five years. Just a little more about these, but one of the things that we're most proud of is last year we started something called Family Business Week. And as you know, American Express has the Shop Small um, Saturday. Uh, we believe that family businesses, which are largely about 80% of the global economy, are so important that, that every day people should identify and support a family business. Uh, but during this week, which is the fourth week in October, right around when we have our Family Business Awards, um, we want people to identify and support and celebrate a family business. I had uh, uh, pizza, uh, you know, uh, my daughter and I had pizza and we uh, went to a place and asked if they were family business and they were so proud that we would ask them, ask them that question. Um, and we've started something called Shop Family where people can buy uh, cards, uh, gift cards um, to really support businesses. I have a TV show called Family Business World, which airs on rvn.tv every Thursday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. We're looking for new family business guests or people who serve family businesses. So uh, if you have some recommendations, let us know. The best way to reach us is at Rothman, R-O-T-H-M-A-N, at F-D-U dot E-D-U. Here, our Family Business Fridays, as I said, we're gonna, what we're going to uh, uh, continue this throughout the year. Now, it's important to know we are going to take next Friday off for the uh, July 4th holiday. So the next time we get together will be in, uh, in two weeks. So next Friday, we won't be having this. Uh, this is our Veterans Launching Ventures program, which is really becoming one of the best veteran entrepreneurship programs in the, in, uh, in the country. And our website for that is www.veteranbusinessworld. We also have a YouTube uh, channel, Rothman Institute of Entrepreneurship. Check that out. We have about a, more than 100 videos. It can be very helpful as you grow your business. I uh, am a member of uh, Governor Murphy's New Jersey Restart and Recovery Advisory Council, where we're, we're getting advanced information about what's opening up. And, and the good news, things are, 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 are starting to open up. You know, the bad news is there's still a crisis, and there's still many, many businesses that are closed here in New Jersey and across the, across the country. One of the things, and I, I show this every, and I'm going to continue to show this, to really show that in the 2009, 2010, the 700,000 was the peak of unemployment because it was a large business unemployment. Now with the small business unemployment, we're upwards of a total of 40 million people that are unemployed. And if you look at 
uh, new, um, you know, at, at where we are. Um, during the Great Depression in 1933, 24.9% of the population was unemployed. We're approaching that now in this nation. That is 22.8, I think it's about 23% are unemployed. And that's really because of the small business crisis, because of small businesses. So it shows you how important small businesses are and how important what you do is and how important what we're talking about is. This in the context of, uh, of states are the unemployment rate by state. Miguel is in Georgia, and you see Georgia actually relatively is, is doing much better than New Jersey. Um, and I think it's even higher, um, getting higher now. So this is a significant national crisis. And one of the reasons this happens, and I show this, is that most businesses are under 100 employees. You look at small business, about 70% are under 100 employees, 20% are under 500 employees, and only 10% are over 500, yet the political and other attention is given to those large businesses. So, so um, with that, and so one of the things we've, we see with this that I've learned in the New Jersey Restart is just some of the information about cash flow. So if you look at this, I know it's a little blurry, it's hard to see, but um, you're looking at uh, the blue here that 20% uh, of the businesses in May and uh, now 31% in June have one to two months of operating cash. Um, 13 to 21% have three months of operating cash, but look at the others. The green has, has, has three to four weeks, yellow one to two weeks, orange two to seven days. The, the red has no operating cash. So, so this is a cash flow crisis. This is a cash flow crisis. So as we talk about marketing, we understand and we feel your pain that a lot of you are, are really struggling with, uh, with cash. So what's, what's happening? So we had heard, you know, outdoor dining's opened up you know, outdoor pools are supposed to be open up. Youth summer camps have opened up. Um, you know, gatherings of 100 or more people is now coming up to 500 people. There's some talk in mid-July they're going to open casinos and have some um, indoor, um, indoor restaurants. So that all depends on what's going on with, uh, with, with health. Um, and so then looking at, and there seems to be quite a willingness of people to really wear face masks. And, and I like to say that the, uh, the, the new normal will be the normal with face masks, face masks. But clearly we're learning from other states how important it is to really, um, to really wear your face mask. You know, you, many of you heard in Texas that they are actually closing, uh, reclosing the state down because they, they didn't take the crisis as seriously as they should. So with that, I, wanna, I want to uh, introduce Miguel Lloyd, who uh, is an expert. And uh, uh, Miguel, I'll stop sharing mine and then um, you can go ahead and share. So welcome. Well, hey, thank you so much. And uh, great insight. Uh, when you start talking about, you know, down here in Georgia, originally I'm, a, I'm from Virginia, of course, uh, which, which you know, uh, others may not. When I got down here to Georgia and kids went back to school at the beginning of August, that was foreign to me because, of course, up, you know, up north, you know, we go back to school usually halfway through September, you know, after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. And so everything you're talking about right now you know, and, and how things are pacing, how things are opening back up in New Jersey, you know, you know, summer uh, camp starting in July, our kids almost be ready to figure out if we're going to send them back to school uh, mm -hmm. by then. So it's going to be interesting. But but thank you so much. I appreciate everybody. Once again, um, as Dale mentioned, my name is Miguel Lloyd. And so my company is Lloyd Media Group. Um, I'm based here in the Atlanta, Georgia market. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, about marketing, but we're going to talk specifically um, we're going to talk about marketing strategies for small businesses, but we're going to talk specifically about social media and how to build your social presence. Because in this day and age, we have to continue to run our businesses. And as we, as we see what is going on uh, currently, you, you, you just have to be able to be nimble. And so what, what we know with what we're doing here with, uh, with these events, this event is happening every Friday. I'm on webinars and and events and Zooms, you know, three or four times a week because this is the new normal. So we might as well get used to it. And so hopefully today, I'm gonna to try to help you out with that a little bit. Hopefully we we'll open the floor and have a few questions on how we can uh, implement this, some of this stuff in our business strategies. Wonderful. So as we talked about, we're gonna talk about building a social, your social presence. Let's, let's start off and talk about the history of modern communication. So some of us, most of us on this call remember what this is, right? Remember when actually television used to go off 
And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, two o'clock in the morning, we'd get, we'd get the national anthem and the, and the eagle flying and uh, TV would turn off. And, but, you know, and, and some of us will remember some of these apparatuses, the, you know, the TV, the, the computer, uh, the answering machine. Um, but, but in this day, and even that long thing with that red cord, they called a telephone and came out of your wall. Well, you know, when we look at where we are today, all of those are in these, in these phones that we carry around in our pockets now. Um, we have the ability to be touched and to touch people at an amazing rate that as marketers, it is, it is something that, that really has changed the game tremendously over the course of the last 10 to 15 years. All content is now digital. Dale mentioned in his, in his presentation earlier, he, he told you about all the platforms where he can be reached, where the organization can be reached via YouTube, Facebook, uh, but you name it now, uh, we're at a point now where all of this content that we want to watch, you know, a lot of people are becoming cord cutters because it, it, the bottom line is we went from clicking the remote to being and chasing clickbait. And so uh, that's who we are. Everybody's trying to reach us now. And so as we are as consumers, we need to learn how to operate as business leaders and, uh, and take advantage of that as well uh, in the way our business practices are. So let's talk about, let's talk about influencers. So you know, you look at some of the people here on this on, on our screen. We've got The Rock, we've got Taylor Swift, Kim Kardashian, LeBron James, Gary, Gary V, who a lot of us in the business community know who Gary V is. All of these folks have an incredible ability to reach millions of people simply by picking up their phone. And, and, it's, and it's simply, you know, one thing people uh, have, I think people are learning more and more now. Kevin Hart and The Rock aren't the biggest movie stars in the world because they make amazing movies. Their movies are okay. <laughs> They're entertaining, they're fun, uh, but what they are, are they are incredible marketers. These two guys are really, really solid marketers. People wonder why when a movie comes out, why they are making the circuit and they're on every television show, Entertainment Tonight, and doing a whole lot of more YouTube videos, more, more uh, uh, TikTok videos, more of these type of things, because that's how, they, that's how they use their talent to touch as many people as they can. LeBron James has used basketball for the last 20 years uh, to make an incredible impact, sell a lot of shoes, but now he's in position having moved to LA to be, to be, to be so impactful when it comes down to marketing and media. He's creating great content that is being distributed all over, all over the world. Uh, Kim Kardashian, who, who started off, you know, early on and has turned that influence into 164 million followers on, on, uh, on, on Twitter, on Instagram, and having the ability to affect uh, the, the legal justice, the justice system going forward. It's not about having the ability to be an influencer because obviously people all have great influence and great reach, but it's all about what you do with that. And so some of you guys may be looking at me and they said, okay, Miguel, oh, yeah, I'm not the rock. I'm not 6'5", 270 pounds of, of, of granite. And, and, and no, that's, that's, that's not me either, guys. I know I may look a little but that's not me either, right? So let's, let's take, for example, D-Nice. Now, I'm an old school hip hop guy. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us who, who grew up in the 80s and 90s might remember him uh, when he looked like this. He's a really a one hit wonder guy. Um, he had one great song, Call Me D-Nice. Incredible, incredible song back in 1989 or 90. I followed him. He's a photographer. He was a photographer primarily. DJ, uh, he was doing pretty well. Well, when, the, when, when everything hit, when, things, when everybody got quarantined, he just decided he was going to start to go on his Instagram feed and just play music and be the DJ that he is um, via Instagram. He went from 200,000 followers to the following week of having uh, 1.8 million. I haven't looked at his, at his followers here recently, but simply by, uh, by turning on the music, and, and he did a great job of if he saw someone come into his comments, if it was if it was Janet Jackson, he would play great Janet Jackson music. People would love it. Oh, Janet's in the room. Oh, Janet, let me play her, her, some of her favorite hits. And it just worked. Was the sound great? Sure, it was okay. Was the experience amazing? It was okay. As you're watching a guy play music, but it's music, right? And what he did was he had the ability to reach people and he grew his influence from 200,000 people to almost 2 million in the span of about two weeks, simply by doing what he does best. When you look in this, in the, in the right-hand corner with, with the, uh, this, the sketch of him, the artwork, when he's pointing, he was actually pointing to the ticker on his feed at the time. It hit 100,000 people 
that were on his stream at the exact at, at that very moment. Oh. And so he, he asked someone say, hey, someone get a screenshot of this, send it to me. And next thing you know, this particular image was all over the internet. And so when, when we talk about, uh, you know, somebody will say, okay, well, I'm not D nice. I'm not that big either. Okay, let's look at Miss Karen Hunter. Karen Hunter is one of my favorite, and she's in New Jersey. She's she's a she's a Jersey girl, right? So Sirius XM Radio. She's on on, on one on channel one twenty six Sirius XM. She's been on there for a while. But she's also a publisher and does some amazing things in that space. About four or five years ago, actually, I guess with the five year anniversary with the uh, tragedy that happened in South Carolina uh, with, with the with the uh, with the church where the people were murdered in the church, she decided she was going to use her platform to make change. And so what did she do? She was a part of the petition that, that went out to the streets and got the flag taken down in the state of South Carolina. From where you guys are, she's sitting in the studio in New York, but because she's a social av advocate with her platform, she decided this has to change and I'm gonna do something about it. And so what she did was she used her influence to activate uh, a tremendous market, to, uh, put pressure on the politicians in South Carolina, all the way from New Jersey, all the way from New York and made change all over the country, especially in South Carolina. Because of social media, I honestly believe that these two gentlemen are the most powerful leaders in the history of the world. And I want you guys to follow me. I don't care if you're talking about George Washington, Martin Luther King, you name it, Gandhi, you name it, Hitler. Imagine if Hitler had the ability to pull out his phone and communicate at the drop of a hat back and back during back during those times now even today barack obama has been president for four years he still has 115 million this was i put this proposal together this presentation together about a month ago so the numbers have probably changed but these guys have tremendous influence and, and the reason why they have this level of influence is because they have an incredible ability to contact and reach their base and the rest of the world strictly by pulling out their phones now what is my point? My point is that regardless of what you feel about these two gentlemen on this page, their level of influence cannot be questioned. It took years for Muhammad Ali or Mahatma Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King to get his message out. It doesn't take that long anymore. And so the, the point that I'm making is that there's a market for everything and everybody. And so as you're looking at your business, you just have to make sure that you're making genuine connections. Now, what you do with those connections are up to you. Uh, depending on what you're selling, depending on what you're marketing, but depending on what you believe in, you have the ability to make these genuine connections. And that's what's, that's, that's what's something that, that, is, uh, that is super important. So let's talk about social media. Let's talk about first is backup. Let's talk about different types of media, owned, earned, and paid media when we start talking about the different types of, of media and how they converge. Now we're going to focus strictly on social today, but own media are outlets that you can, can create, leverage, and control. Now we were talking earlier, Jonathan and I were talking before we came on with all the mergers that are going on back and forth, and it doesn't matter the industry. I don't care if you are in, in, in the waste management business or in the media business or in the banking business, it's kind of hard to really grow and scale and be independent in this day and age. Uh, and so when we talk about owned media, we're going to talk about what exactly is owned media, because at this point, it's hard to determine what it owns. But these are things that you, you do own. Your, your website, mobile application you build for your business, newsletters, flyers, t-shirts, hats. Those are things that you can control in the small to, mid, small to mid-sized business in comparison to some of the larger mediums that are out there. These are a few mediums that, 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 uh, that, I, that I'm on. So the question is, do we own these mediums? The question is, do we own these mediums? And the truth is, no, we don't. We manage them. You know, we don't own Facebook. We don't own Instagram, Twitter. Um, you know, we all probably have some friends and family or we've seen some things online where people have gotten in Facebook jail. Uh, they've been shut out of these mediums. Uh, one question I hear when we, our clients will ask us all the time was one of the services we provide is we help people to stream and, and, and do presentations like the one you're seeing here. And people say, well, hey, can we stream to, to Instagram? Well, that's against Instagram's terms of service. And if Instagram decides that, they, that you've made enough noise with that, then all of a sudden they shut your account down. All the time you built, time to build up that audience, you could possibly lose strictly by not following the rules that they have instituted. And so we don't own these mediums, we manage them. 
what we do own is the influence that we have. And so as, as, as we, as we're looking, as we're looking at, at the level of influence that we have, let me see, we have a, let me see that, make sure that question in the chat is not directed to me and I, is there a way to please? Oh, okay. All right. Do you want to make the screen full screen? I don't know if you guys can handle that on your end. Well, what, what you can do is actually put speaker view on. So all you see is the, is the speaker. And so it is pretty full screen if you do that. Yes. And that's, that's to be only, only, and that's interesting that you bring that up because one of the reasons why we offer this service to, to clients is because that is a uh, end user thing. So as he mentioned, you have an option, like right now I'm looking at all five of the panelists, but you can go to speaker view, whoever has that question and it will, and you'll be able to uh, just see just me speaking when I'm speaking, unless anyone else is, is unmuted. So great, great point Dale. So as we mentioned, um, let me go back to a previous slide. So we own what we do with our influence on social media. And that is no matter the size of your influence. Yeah, you're not a someone who's got 117 million followers like Barack Obama. Who else is, right? Did he, you know, I'm pretty sure between himself and maybe Beyonce, uh, he's probably got the most followers of, of, of anybody in the world. But if you have your 2,000 uh, followers and you are a business right there in New Jersey that's serving a community in a small town in New Jersey and everyone knows you, you can use this medium, no matter the size, to market your, your products and services. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. <clears throat> but remember, the, you know, as I mentioned, the rules are always changing. I, you know, I wrote this blog a few years back, uh, and, you know, and this stuff, and the numbers are a, little, are a little old. But here's the point. People ask me the question, why is it when I post on social media, why do I post on Facebook, the same 15 or 20 people are commenting on my post? The truth is, is that Facebook is a very passively aggressive company. They, they let you believe that you've got all this reach and you can do all, you put this together, amazing posts, you post it on social media, you know everybody's just gonna run to it. If you notice there's a difference between the way people respond to your social, family, just regular social media posts in comparison to when you're marketing a product or a service. And that's on purpose. Facebook knows, the algorithms know. Um, there are people who are getting shut out of Facebook, especially now with the heightened scrutiny that they're experiencing with, uh, with the political season. And so the point is that Facebook, when it's all said and done, uh, is a paid medium. Going back to the example of, of, of D-Nice that we talked about earlier. Now, as I mentioned, he went from, he went from you know, whatever it was, 200,000 followers to 1.8 million followers in a couple of weeks. Well, what happened? The record company said, uh-oh, DJs, you're not paying us to do this. You're making money off of us. We're going to shut you down. We're going to go to Instagram. We're going to say, don't let them do that because they're not paying us to do that. Well, for people who are in the, in the, in the, in the industry, DJs, if that was the case, then when DJs DJ at a club or whatever, you think that would be a problem. Well, most of the time, those nightclubs, uh, they have licenses, BMI licenses to, to play the music. To me, it doesn't make sense if I'm a record company because my records are being exposed. Uh, people are still going to benefit from it. But what happened was that, once again, D-Nice used a platform he did not own, gained a tremendous amount of influence, and immediately the red flags came up. Social media is a paid, is, is media is a paid marketing medium. That, that's what the truth is. We are the audience. If anybody ever tells you that eventually Facebook is going to charge you to be on their platform, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because we are the audience. They're selling data. And, and Dale, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or comments. I do, I do have a question because that, that's yeah. very interesting about Facebook. Because I've, you know, if I put something silly up, I get a lot of responses. If I put Absolutely. something like, like about this, so, so you're saying Facebook really, that, that adjusts it. So, you, uh, you know, you don't get responses. Absolutely. Facebook, Facebook muzzles your, muzzles your post. Their, 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 their rationale is if you've got 2000 followers and every time someone posts, you saw their post, there's no way you could keep up. Right. So the rationale on that side makes sense. But if I post something about this event, not as many people are going to see it because obviously this is a business event that we have and there's a potential commerce coming through. And, but what will happen is that they'll say, Oh, this post has a potential of reaching 85% more of your followers. If you give us 10 bucks. Right. Right. So it's right. very passive. It's a very passive, uh, a sales sale. And 
And most people say, hey, what is 10 bucks? What is 20 bucks? And there was a time uh, where with Facebook, you would pay for that immediately. Now they bill you monthly. Mm. Right. And so for people who have who have bought any sort of Facebook, you know, raise your hand. Let us know. that You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, look like there's a question in the chat. Jennifer, which social media platform is good to start with Facebook or Instagram or other? What you actually, Jennifer, later on is coming in. I'm going to talk about the different demographics of those. Great question. Um, so let me let me get back so we can get to that. Get to that particular slide. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Know your audiences. And I think it might be coming up right now. Yep. Demographics of so perfect timing, Jennifer. Let's look at the demographics of the different different social mediums. So Facebook, seventy five percent female, sixty three percent male. Uh, sixty five seventy five percent of all females, sixty three percent of all males, are on Facebook. When you start to look at the age demographic, uh, it's really a, a, you know between eighteen to sixty four, where the, the the bulk of their of the folks are. Education is pretty pretty even across the board. Income level pretty even across the board. Pretty much everybody's on Facebook. Uh, the only people who are out, aren't under aren't, aren't on Facebook are, are people who are under the age of eighteen to twenty, where my daughter lives and where um, she says, "Daddy, I will never get on Facebook." My, my daughter too. So yeah. <laughs> right. They say that's where the old people are. I'm not coming over there with you because yeah. I know you're there. So I'm not coming over there. I'm going to the TikTok party. Uh, I'm not coming to the Facebook party. <laughs> so we look at Instagram, uh, Instagram, 43% of all uh, women, 31% of all males. As you can tell, it's a little bit younger. Uh, the skews 13 to 17, 18 to 29, and starts to taper off when you get past the age of 49 years old. Um, urban, suburban, you know, a little bit more city, education levels, pretty even. Twitter, uh, tw 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 Twitter's interesting. Twitter's been struggling a little bit because it's, it's, it's a certain type of medium, right? Um, you know, a lot of us stay away from Twitter. Uh, the numbers are not as strong, but they, but they still, it's a still, still extremely powerful medium uh, because it's one of the granddaddies of, of, of that deal. LinkedIn, as many of us here on here are probably uh, very active on LinkedIn. You know, that prime job search age of 30 to 49 years old, you see that's what a larger number is, where 37% uh, of all people 30 to 49 are active on LinkedIn. Pretty even, a little bit more skews, a little bit more male than female. Uh, urban to suburban is very, very similar. Uh, um, of course, it would make sense that there's a lot more folks with college degrees that are on LinkedIn. When we look at Pinterest, Pinterest uh, is, is a medium for people who are in this in the um, retail space, people do not use and do not use Pinterest as much as they should. Mm. Um, Pinterest is a good medium. Uh, and it's not as expensive as some of the others because a lot of people don't look at Pinterest as being what it is. If you are selling products, if you are in the restaurant business or you're selling a book or anything that is visual, as you can see, very highly skewed towards a female market. Um, the age range anywhere between 18 to 50 are very strong all the way up to, to 65. Um, doesn't matter or if you're if you're in the city in the suburbs or, or in the country, uh, all very strong. Look at the household income. $75,000 and above 41% are on Pinterest. So Pinterest kind of Pinterest is a little bit more of a boutique feel, right? Pinterest is a little bit more where you look at it. If you say, what's my snapshot? A snapshot of a Pinterest person is going to be in the age uh, between 30 and 65 years old, a woman who makes pretty good money and is well-educated. That sounds like a pretty good market. M Miguel, and yes, so as, you, as you think about, so, so let, let's target to start the restaurants. And, yes. and, you know, and so I'm a restaurant, I'm about to open up. I hadn't done much marketing. You know, mm -hmm. you're saying Pinterest is good for restaurants. You know, um, you can answer this now or answer it before. But no, no, yeah, absolutely. Pinterest is a great place for restaurant, especially. If, and here's the thing about restaurants: people who have who are ready, uh, who are already doing to-go orders, people who are already selling recipes, uh, they were already in better position than folks who you know. We've had this experience. These restaurants said, "I don't want to do this to-go stuff." I, well, you don't want to be in business in 2020 and beyond. Right. Uh, but because your capacity, even when people start to get comfortable coming back out, you're not going to reach the capacity that you were used to when you had those Friday nights and there was a two hour wait and your restaurant was full. Yeah, you're going to have a two hour wait, but, but the capacity of your restaurant is smaller. So if you want to showcase that experience, Pinterest is a great way to do that visually. In addition to Instagram, where you can do uh, videos and things. And then of course, now everybody's into the live uh, live broadcast. But but Pinterest is a great way to do visuals, but you got to have a great photographer 
right. you know, you want to have a great photographer that can that can take care of those great images. And you can use that as a tool. And so the ad for, for again, and let's let's bring it to the basics because sure. a lot of restaurants. So, so the and how do you you go about? You get a Pinterest account. You go about how does how does that work? And how do you lay it out? Or how would you advise they lay it out if I'm a restaurant? Yeah, so so I would definitely it would be a place I would showcase my menu. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely showcase your lost leader item. Mm -hmm. uh, if you got if you got the best wings in town, you know, showcase those wings. Get a nice photographer to take some amazing pictures of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you wanted to kind of give them some insight on the secret sauce, we have a a good friend of ours who's an amazing caterer here um, in Atlanta. A brother by the name by the name of Juan Montier, uh, Shea Montier is is, is the, and. He says, I don't have a problem giving them images or giving them the recipe because they can't make it the way I can. <laughs> and that's okay, right? Because, you know, ultimately the goal is if you have the, you know, if you want to get into prepared foods, you want to send stuff out, you know, I, my favorite Thai restaurant up the street, I can go get the recipe all day long. It's not going to taste the way they do, the way it right. tastes for them. Yeah. So, yeah, so great imagery, getting a nice photographer to take that picture take those pictures and, and, and sell, sell, sell the lifestyle. Pinterest is very much like a lifestyle. It's a magazine. Well, well, now how do you get it to, can you email it? Can you, now, now how do you get a pay? You have a Pinterest page. Yeah. I have a restaurant. How do I get it to people who aren't on Pinterest? Is there a way to do this? Yeah, you, you, you can email it, but of course, just like all the other mediums, once you email that link, if you put it in your newsletter, uh, they're going to want them to start a Pinterest account. Cause that's, that's how they get them into their community. Uh, but yes, you can send that link. And the great thing about Pinterest is that, Pinterest likes to grab images from your existing website. Okay. okay. So you have an image and you have a link where people can get more information. And then that will take them directly to your, directly to the website, which will be outside of Pinterest and Pinterest is totally all right with that. Interesting. Is, is there a cost for Pinterest? Is there a cost to join Pinterest? Or no, there's no cost to join any of these social mediums um, because they're all sell. They all sell advertising. Right. right. They all sell advertising within, within the platform. Right, and so yeah. you can, you can and, and I'm asking these basic questions because you can make, how many folks say, okay, I have a rest, I, I have a website, that's all I need. Yeah, you know, that's where people go. Um, so, so as we talk about the restaurants, because this is they're the ones who've been struggling, they've been they've yes. been hurt the most. Yes. What, what some of your your client, what are you advising some of the restaurants to do? You know, as they're thinking about the marketing going forward. That's a great question. Um, one thing they need to stop fighting the fact that this is the new normal. Right. The new normal, I don't care what type of restaurant you have, the new normal is that people are going to want to order to go. They're going to want to go. I, I had clients who, you know, and friends I was advising, they didn't want to be on DoorDash because they didn't like the fees. They didn't like to be on Uber Eats because of the fees or Postmates. Here's the thing. You are in the food business. You can't put, you can't put chicken on sale and resell it six days later like you can sneakers. You got to sell that food or you're going to lose a lot of money. So if, if I go on my local DoorDash, Uber Eats, wherever, and say, okay, what am I in the mood for today? I need to make sure that I'm in that community where people can respond and get some of that food out of my refrigerator, into my fryers, and out of those boxes and out the door. And, and, and I've got restaurants in our community that I love, that I'm so disappointed that they're not back open, but the restaurants that are, the food is just okay, they're the ones that ran right back out there and got right back into business. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit of a, so, so if I were to give some advice to restaurant owners, you know, if you are the type that said, you know, you got a little bit of higher end, you know, you got three, four stars and, and you, you don't want to really be perceived, you got to make a decision. You know, there was a time when, and I'm not sure I have to look, I haven't looked at the ownership um, rotations recently, but at one time McDonald's owned Ruth Chris. So, and I don't know if you guys have Ruth Chris Steakhouses in New Jersey up top. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, McDonald's owns, owns Ruth Chris. So, you bring out those amazing steaks and those 500 degree plates, great experience. But those 99 cent hamburgers were, were backdooring and supporting that beautiful $100 steak. So, restaurants like that, in order to, to stay in the business, they got to find a happy medium with that experience to make sure that they're staying in business. So many restaurants right now are, are, have been slow to it. They may have gotten their PPP money uh, and they haven't really used that in a way that will get people back in the door. As right. people are coming back out into, into the marketplace, uh, before then, they still need to be in the business where they're dropping fo food off of people's doors. And that's the problem I think a lot of restaurant owners have had. Uh, they just, some people are just have not adjusted to the time.
So, so, so that's restaurants. Now, retail. So I'm on the Main Street Committee. So the Main Street, the retail's coming back. Mm-hmm. You know, they, uh, um, you know, what, what have you seen? What are some of the more innovative things you've seen out there for, for, for the retail marketing? Yeah, it's definitely curbside. Um, curbside. I've, I've said for years that anybody in retail, I don't care if it's the mom and pop boutique or Walmart, you got to get to the point that your rest, your stores, your retail location is really a warehouse in your community. Hmm. It just makes sense, right? Because if you have all this space and you're not online and you don't have e-commerce in your, in your, in your marketing plan, then you're really putting yourself behind the eight ball. Because now, even as we get back out into the world, here's the thing. What is, what, what is this pandemic done to us that has, what this pandemic has done as it has, escalated the pacing of what was already happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody was going to e-commerce. Right. People were inching along at it, inching along, and now we're all used to it. With the stores opening, we've been open back up here in Georgia since early May. For the most part, when you walk into any of these retail locations, they don't have the stuff in stock. Right. It's not there. Right. right? So what are they telling you? And I'm a, I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm six foot three. The, the 2XL stuff, <laughs> nobody has. Right, right. So I might as well go back home, grab my phone, order it online, and have it sent to the house. So, so if anybody who is in retail, you have to position yourself now. You have Square, you have Shopify, you have WooCommerce, you have the ability to take that same inventory, put it on your website, and sell it. And actually, from a, from a, from a uh, logistics standpoint, if you learn that process and manage it well, you can cut your costs mm-hmm. because you're not having a lot of stuff sitting on your shelf, taking up space, and you're waiting to have to put it on sale. Hey, right. if you know that, that you're selling 10 of these this week, you order 12, you sell those 10, and then if you sell 12 every week, all of a sudden you increase your inventory to 15 or whatever. You can monitor that much better than it was when you just got a big old box of T-shirts and all of a sudden, six months later, you got that bin everybody's digging through <laughs> and, and, and you got a sale tag on it. And so from a logistics standpoint, that's something, and you probably know some people in the log- logistics space, um, that, that, that's, that's a game changer. That is the game changer. But, but some people are just moving, moving way too slow to make those adjustments. To make them that. Now, Tony Russo, uh, the, the president of CIA and J is mm-hmm. one of our partners here. And, and, and Tony, uh, any questions that you've, you've heard from your members about marketing or anything? No, thanks, Dale. And Miguel, great information. I mean, uh, you know, you hit the, the mark right on the head. I guess the question for you, because so many of our members now, and our, we represent all business sectors, a mm-hmm. lot of them are all working remotely. Mm-hmm. What would you say about traditional mail and, and marketing uh, the old-fashioned way? And, and for example, we produced a business magazine, and we just digitized it uh, last mm-hmm. month. Yeah, and we also print it, but do you give any, would you give a thumbs up on traditional mail as a way to market? So you're talking to an old school radio guy. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'm going to lean towards electronic media. Uh, but the problem with digital mail, not when I, when I got out of the radio business 15 years ago, when they were saying that there was an average return of anywhere between one and 3% then on, on, on that mail, there's pros and cons to it all, right? There really are. Um, I'm not saying, I think all mediums work if you dominate that medium and you're very consistent. I'm just not a big, big fan of what I think is waste. And I can just, you know, I can look on my desk right now and see stuff that was mailed to me that I'm just like, they're going to mail me five more of these in the next three weeks. And I'm still not going to buy anything. Yeah. But what's going to happen with me is that if, if, I, if I'm on someone's email list, and I get those emails of, of, of bed, bed, bath, and beyond, and I'm ready to go buy some towels, I'm just going to go to my email. But, that's, but it, depends on, it depends on your market. So I guess I'm kind of dancing around it. I'm not a huge fan of direct mail because of the cost that's associated with it. But what I also understand is that in small communities and for a demographic 45 plus, it really works. Um, and so I had an experience. My, my wife happens to be a, uh, a regional manager for, for, uh, for JC Penney's. And so about two years ago, there was a digital coupon campaign that um, her region did. It worked well, but it was done via text messaging and the, and the coupons were digital. 
And imagine if that becomes the norm, which it has become, how much that's saving you in cost. Because everybody's got a phone, everybody's receiving text messages, everybody's got their phone in their pocket. I'm not walking around with this in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, I could appreciate it. I, and I don't know if you covered it, but email marketing, right? Yeah. Uh, for example, again, last month we, we spent considerable resources to digitize our magazine mm -hmm. and it went into a lot of people's clutter and, and junk mail. And so I think information is, everybody's on information overload. Load. They, they are, they are. Email is still strong, but to your point, the, the email um, uh, um, platforms are cutting a lot of that out. What's been more successful in, or gaining, gaining ground is text messages. The text message process, and then what you do is you link it back to your website. Ultimately, the goal is to link people back to where you can control how the information is disseminated to them, which should be on your website. Once you get them there, you can upsell them to whatever it is you're trying to sell them because now you've got them in your community. Yeah, no, good point. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. But, but so, so I, let me bring it down some. Uh, and sure. and uh, so the text messages, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, I, I, I tell my friends to text me because I, I don't get emails. I get so many emails. How do, you, how do you make that work? How do you make the text messages? You know, how do you get it? You get, you know, do people, you ask people for it? What's the process that, that Tony or might use for, for text messaging? Yeah, so, you know, there's an opt-in process. Moment, whether you're using MailChimp or Constant Contact or Infusionsoft, some of these other mail services, you can have the phone number um, be a, and you give people that text option. Here's the thing. People don't want so much to have their phone ring, but they'll check a text message. Yeah. You know, I think the last number I saw was about 85% of all text messages are open. Mm -hmm. That number is nowhere close when it comes down to email. Right. Now, right. mind you, if you spam them, then eventually they'll block you. <laughs> but okay. as long as you're giving them great information and it's not obvious that this is that you're just spamming them to death. Here's the thing. People love free information. If you are in a, the finance space and you are helping people with information on how to get the PPP loan or, or the, you know, that's the type of stuff that people say, oh, I like these people. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, when you have a small sales message there, they may click on that link and then you have an opportunity to engage. Right. Um, the, the, you even think about it now. Who, who of us here would have, would have thought we would ever have the ability to get a big old huge coin and go in a parking lot and go get your car out of a vending machine? <laughs> right? Like, like, whose imagination came up with that? And now Carvana has, has, has turned... The, the, the used car business on its ear. Mm. You know, the, 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 the whole standpoint of coming at someone as a used car salesman and just going hard with people, it doesn't work like it used to. The, uh, people don't want to be sold. They have access to incredible amounts of information. And so by the time they come through, they know, they know what their finance rate is. They, they know how much they, what size of car that they can buy. You're really just almost, you know, you're just making a transaction for the most part. Right. in that scenario. So everything works. You have to be consistent. But here's what we know as, 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 as marketers. It's not like it was when I was in the radio business, we had to wait 90 days to get the, the, the numbers to tell us how effective a radio station was doing. Right. Folks come out here, they do campaigns, hashtag, okay, I can study this and say, I had a return a click rate on this particular campaign and we're gonna do that again almost in real time. Right. The, you so know, we, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we have a question about text messaging with B2B, business to business. Yes. Does it work? Does it work as well for that? Or is it really more a retail thing with text messaging? No, it, it, it can work B2B, but in the B2B scenario, you have to be willing to give, 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 and then receive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we as business people, we're all pretty savvy, right? You know, we're selling. So we know when we're being sold. So then you have to say, okay, if I'm a business person and I'm selling, I'm a banker and I wanted to sell the potential loan products, then I need to, to share information and then help people to make a decision, not just sell them just outright. So when it comes down to business and texting, I'll be honest with you, it works better in retail because it's transactional. 40% off of dinner tonight. Perfect. I'm in the mood for Italian. Sure, I'll take 40% off my dinner tonight. But you say 40% off of a loan and you're like, hmm, what's the catch? Right, right. Immediately, because we've done enough home loans and car loans or whatever and said that number doesn't look right. You're trying to get me in, rope me in. 
you, you see what I'm saying? So from a standpoint of, of answering the question, yes, text message can work in a B2B, but I would really recommend it be a little bit more of an educational, in, informational, preparing them to come to an event like this, where you're really teaching them something and showing them why you can bring value to their particular community or their family. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask another question, Dale? Yeah, go ahead, tell, yeah, tell you, yeah. You know, just I'd, I'd be curious, Miguel, your take on the day of the week that's ideal to send out a, a campaign and the time of the day. Yeah, uh, we, we actually, my partner, we, we have a program called Reset Sales and Marketing. Um, and we talk about that. Uh, when is the best time to do webinars? When is it? Now, right now with COVID, we're all home. <laughs> <laughs> but but before we were going, before we were all locked in, you know, it's usually a, a Tuesday through Thursday, anywhere between having your webinars between 10 and 1 okay. to whatever time zone that you're in. For example, if you if you are in, in Jersey and you do have some clients that are in L.A., you don't want to have your webinars at 8 in the morning. It's 5 in the morning for them. You know, so if you have a webinar at 2 for them, that's 11. Now, that might be close to lunch, right? But right now, you know, people are, are home and, and, and they're pretty responsive. You'd be surprised. Too. Evening, evening events are, are working pretty good, too. Right. Um, I've seen a lot of folks that, you know, with my organization and then also the organizations I serve in uh, with the Atlanta Black Chambers and the uh, 100 Black Men of Atlanta, we do events in the evening that actually are well attended as well and they're informative. Because, hey, there's nothing good on television. There's no new... <laughs> We're tired of watching all those terrible movies on Netflix, and so let's get informed. And I thought a few of our members that were on the insurance side did something interesting where they brought a musician in and had a couch concert, uh, and it was a good way to market their brand. That's you know, true. it was after work hours, and they had about 90 people, which I might was on a Friday night. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. What else are we doing right now? Right, right. You know, it's, it's literally, I was, I was talking, I was talking at, and Jennifer's on the line. We had a quick conversation earlier. When your office is in your home, you don't know when to leave the office. <laughs> <laughs> so, working longer hours. Yeah. So when you have an event from six to eight in the evening, that's the normal afternoon drive time commute that we were used to. And so you still have the energy to still engage. And, and, and to your point, we have, um, these happy hour networking events that we've done virtually uh, that I've been participated in and they've been amazing. Uh, we've had DJs that have connected in. I had one guy who owns a restaurant in, uh, in, in, in the Atlanta area and he served as a DJ. And at the same time he was DJing from his establishment. So now that he's back open for business, where's our community going to go? We're going to go to his restaurant because of the fact that we've been exposed to it. Um, and we want to get back out. I haven't been back over there yet, but <laughs> I'm not ready. My family, we're not ready. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Cool. Any other questions? This is great. I'm having a blast. Yeah, no, no, the, the, so, so things like hood suites, you know, you know, for, again, I'm trying to make it sure because you'd be amazed. And, and, and I have to tell the audience, I mean, I know New Jersey very well. I know Atlanta very well. Atlanta is so far ahead in innovative things. And like Carvana, I, I never even heard of. Oh, honest. really? I don't think we have that in Jersey. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, you know, okay. but there are other things down there that have that. So, so what's Hootsuite and what are things like Hootsuite and, and, and how do people use that and RS, RSS feed, you know, how do right. you do that? So Hootsuite is, is the ability to, for you to manage all your social media uh, with one. I, I personally, with my team, we, um, we use Buffer, okay. uh, but it's similar, Hootsuite, Buffer. It's the ability for you to post this to various social mediums simultaneously. And it is also a great way for you to measure the results. Okay. One thing you'll find, guys, that video has a four to five times better impact than still imagery. And then that much better than just text. Mm -hmm. If you are in a position where you just don't like to do video, find somebody else in your company that can do it. Mm -hmm. Because video is so important right now. Um, make sure your video and 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 I'm and I, I'm only looking at the two guys pictures I see here. We're of a certain age, where you know we had a longer attention span. <laughs> That's right. People don't have long attention spans now. Every time you open up your phone, there's some two or three minute video of of a cat dancing or something else that has caught your attention. So to, if you if you have a video that's longer than four or five minutes, it better be very compelling, or you better put your message on the front end because people are not going to see the whole thing. So what should it be? A one minute, one minute video, or what? What, what do you say? 
So anything under one minute, under like for example, Instagram, anything under one minute, you can just post straight to Instagram. If it's beyond one minute, then you have to post it to IGTV. So everybody's not going to click over to IGTV. So you got, I'm always looking at it from a consumer standpoint. Mm -hmm. How much patience does a consumer have for me? Not the people in my face who love me. It's the people who I want to get to know. And get, no, they're not going to watch a three minute video of you unless it's really good. Right. So, you know, I, I produced, uh, helped uh, um, some clients produce a wedding, I mean a wedding, a marriage series about two years ago. And they wanted to do a six part series on marriage. They laid it all out. It was amazing. We had a blast. We shot it in two days. But I told them, there's not going to be any segment that's going to be longer than seven minutes. Mm. They said, why, Miguel? I said, because you're going to have the ability to, to chop this up in segments and if you want to use one segment of this to put out on social media to sell the rest of the of the package then that's what we're going to do if you guys talk consecutively for 20 minutes you're going to lose people unless it is really really compelling content now that was two years ago and and you know it used to be a time we would say you know we would look at this stuff and three to four year old data was cool three to four year old data in this day and age dale you just showed some data that was from last month right right Right. because it's available and so now if we look at the way things that we're so inundated with one and two and three minute videos that will consume our day imagine you're trying to get somebody to sit down there and watch 20 minutes now the the, the the psychology of it all is we're also in a culture of binge watching right right so it's kind of a, a swing of a pendulum right you got everybody who's all who, who's all inundated with these one and two minute videos but then some people sit down for a whole weekend and watch all eight seasons of Game of Thrones. It's, right. it's you know, so your, your content has got to be dynamic right. to get people uh, get people's attention for that long. But on average, if you've got a marketing message, you've got to be focused on short clips, short bites that's going to feed into mediums you control, which would be your website, things of that nature. So, yeah. so, so let me ask another question because, uh, um, you know, we feel, you, you often feel like you're being stalked. If you go on a website and you look up, I looked up, you know, some Roger Federer tennis shoes. Yeah. Every time I go on, you know, on Gmail, you yeah. know, or, you know, I, I'm, they're sending me tennis shoes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you're being stalked. You're being stalked. And, and, yeah, and, yeah. You're being stalked. Yeah. <laughs> you are. It's, and, called, it's called search retargeting. You know, yeah, exactly. um, uh, you know, it's a service that, that we offer. We don't do a lot of it. Uh -huh. uh, we should do more. Uh -huh. But yeah, you're being stalked. Yeah. yeah, if if you if if you go to Amazon and and you click on that microphone like I'll do sometime for equipment, then all of a sudden everywhere I go on the web, that same microphone is popping up, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, until I make a decision or until I say stop sending me that ad, I'm not ready to buy. Right. Yep, you're being stalked. So yeah, that's um, that's new normal. And and, and uh, you know um, another question. So you know most people, everybody has Gmail now, and you have Gmail, and so mm -hmm. you go into Gmail, you know, you Google Chrome, and then these ads pop popping in. You know, is that and it's annoying. I mean, I don't know why they do that because I'm not gonna buy from anybody that does that. Is that yeah. is there any marketing benefit of that? To, to well, yeah, it's it's a marketing benefit in, in, in that eventually you you know you're gonna relent is what is what the, <laughs> finally you're just gonna say all right, what is that you're selling? Me personally, I just have this thing about Google. I think they're just too aggressive. Right, right. Um, they make you get a Gmail account. There's some websites that won't work or only work on Chrome. Right. Um, you know, stuff that's just like, okay, dude, I'm trying to make an, I, I want to make my own decisions on how I want to move. Uh, so yeah, Google, Google will, will and I don't even, I, I've had a, I still have a Yahoo email address that I never check. Anytime there's a spam person who's trying to, I always give them that address because if I feel like seeing your stuff, I'll go over there and look at that email address. But the stuff that really means something to me, you'll never get that email address because you're not going to flood my inbox. Right, right. The, um, so, so explain again. So we'll go back to uh, the Hootsuite or, mm -hmm. or uh, what. Now, how does that work? So the, you said that manages your social media. How would someone who's just getting into it, how, do they, how does that work? How would they use that for their marketing? Sure. So, um, so what is really do is really like a repository. So you can, here's a couple things you can do with a Hootsuite with a, um, 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 gosh, Buffer, the one that I use, you can schedule them. Mm -hmm. You can monitor how great it was respond. People responded to, you can go back through there and say, Hey, let me go post that again. Right. 
right? You can make decisions on whether or not you want to post it to your feed or in the case of Instagram or Facebook to your feed or your story because there's a difference and there's a strategy to that. Uh, the good thing about it for people who are, who are, who are data, who are data people, it's something you can really gauge and say, okay, I posted this particular video about, you know, a certain type of loan and people really responded because the climate was good for that. Right. Now, all of a sudden, if you got an ad you created right now and you're in the money business and you're going to help people get the PPP loans, but then you repost that in the middle of July, it's not timely because the deadline is passed. Right. And some people will, will, some people will get a little lazy and they'll automate the process and then look up. I see it all the time. You know, it'll be an ad, a Christmas ad that's running in March. Mm -hmm. Like you did not send, and here's the thing, uh, here's a little nugget guys. Unless you got a really good salesperson at your local television station, radio station, wherever, they don't care. <laughs> if you send them some bad creative, they're not in the business of, create, of your creative. They're in the business of making sure they're hitting their numbers every month. So if you got a bad creative and that sale is done, unless you got a really good sales guy, like I, you know, my, my sales manager didn't really like me because I'm just not going to sell people stuff that doesn't work. Okay. I got five grand for this particular ad campaign. And my question would be, okay, so what's the purpose? What, you know, what are you trying to do here? My sales managers would be like, who cares? Get the money. <laughs> I always was about, hey, I wanted to work for my client. I guess this is why I'm an entrepreneur because <laughs> I wasn't really good at having somebody telling me go sell somebody some bad, bad meat and and who cares, <laughs> right? That's just not right. the way I operate. Right. Um, right. So, uh, so yeah, so so the social media, um, the, the who squeeze the buffers, all these guys, um, they help you to really know what works uh, instead of you just kind of shooting in the dark. And that's the biggest thing. You don't want to shoot in the dark. You want to have a plan. You want to have a methodology to what you're doing. And these platforms will help you do that. Now, mind you, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, they'll give you some, some, some basic information in their own platforms as well. They don't want you using Hootsuite and Buffer. and, and these, They want you to use everything for them. We can provide everything for you. Um, that's the reason why Facebook will buy companies and put them on the shelf, because they buy them for the technology, ramp them into what they're already doing, and they put these guys out of business, write them a billion-dollar check, and say, go bye-bye. Right. But, but, right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You, and again, I mean, this, is, this is great. And we're going to have you back because this is, uh, I, I know this, I know people are learning. I'm learning a lot. Yeah, um, so, so, so you have a, you have a retail restaurant, you mm -hmm. know, your local customers, right? Mm -hmm. So you have their email addresses and so on. How yeah. do you, how do you make sure you're doing something that attracts you? Say you're in Montclair, New Jersey. How mm -hmm. do you do something to attract the people in that area? I mean, is there any trick to that before we, we, we go? Absolutely. So um, you have the email address. Uh, if you have their cell phone numbers, you can do uh, geo-targeted advertising. Okay. Um, you can do, if, if you're in a restaurant in Montclair, New Jersey, you want to advertise to the people who live in the 10 to 15 mile radius of your business, you can do that. Um, mm -hmm. That's something we can help you with. Um, but you want to constantly stay in front of them. Now, you know, the restaurant business, I think it's okay to be a little bit more aggressive with couponing and things because it is a, it's, it's, a, it's an impulse buy. Right. I don't feel like cooking tonight. All of a sudden, I got this text message at 445. It says, I don't, you don't feel like cooking tonight? Here, you know, here's a 20% discount for our pizza tonight, right? Here's the great thing about that. If you are in the restaurant business and this week, it is no different than the way restaurants have done over the years. Why do restaurants say, okay, what is your special of the day? The special of the day is based on, I may have gotten too much fish today. <laughs> and all of a sudden, now this fish is the special of the day. Because in 48 hours or 24 hours, it's got to go. So I'm going to sell it at a good price. Here's the thing. You can put a campaign out immediately. If you know people love to come to your restaurant on a Thursday night, 11, 11 a.m., 1, 1, I mean, 11 p.m., 11 a.m., 1 p.m. on that afternoon, you look in your refrigerator and say, hmm, we got a lot of chicken left. We need to, we need to get an ad out really quick. Now, you got to have somebody who knows what you're doing. Right. You know, who can put some creative together for you real quick and get it out. But for the most part, obviously, you don't want to work fly by the seat of your pants like that. Right. But it happens. Right. It happens. Right. Sometimes you got to put stuff on sale because if you, you don't want to lose money. You want to make sure that you are moving that product. Well, and again, with, with it, these things go so quickly. Um, how do people get in touch with you, Miguel? If, if uh, you're in the land, you're in Atlanta, but you still will work with people. What's Absolutely. Your, how do they connect, connect with you? Absolutely. My email address is Miguel. I'll put it in the chat, Miguel at LloydMediaGroup.net. Okay. Um, my web, website is LloydMediaGroup.net. 
Okay. Um, and and then uh, I don't think I have. I may have. Let me look on on here. I think I have a uh, slide with with my contact information on it. Let's see. And I'm glad we. Uh, I, I love. I love to get into dialogue more than just just yeah. talking. Okay. So this here here is my here's my contact information on LinkedIn. That that's my buddy, my my business partner, Robbie Gory. We do these reset sales and marketing uh, events, and, and we we did a six module web series on this. Um, I can drop you guys a link in that if you guys want to get access to that content. Now I'm 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 a, I'm a little biased because I got I got to drop back. I got to bring this picture in now. Th this content actually is is a uh, is a little old, but it is on our website. Okay. This is my wife Tracy Lloyd. Tracy Hello. is uh, and she actually is in here off screen. She can just say hi. Hello everyone. Hey, how you doing? Right here, you know. Good to see you. But um, she she's a pretty she's pretty amazing. So if you ever wanted to have someone who has ran, um, you know, multi-million dollar operations. Right now, she's, she's the district manager for all the J.C. Penney's in the state of Georgia. Um, military chick, she went to school up there near you guys, a little, little school called her West Point Military Academy, USMA. Um, so um, she's pretty dope. I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of married up, guys, if, if you were. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 you're honest. So if you ever wanted to, she's got this presentation, Big Box Operations for Everyday Businesses. If you guys are interested in hearing her do that presentation, you know, she, she'd be available to, for that as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we, you know, um, so that's the way to reach me. I would love to help you with anything, if, in, in, whether it be social media, overall, just marketing strategy. Um, if you want to get into some media, buy, media planning and buying, I've got, I've got 25 years experience in that space, and I would love to be able to help you guys. Yeah. Um, but rest assured with us, we so care so much about our clients. It's not just about just churning, okay. It is, when anybody, anybody ever asked me, well, how much does it cost to do X? I kind of exhale first <laughs> because I'm not good at just saying, what you're asking for is gonna cost X because that's just not the way that it works in the marketing space. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, I need to know what, I need to know what you need, what you're trying to accomplish before I start throwing numbers out there. And the bottom line is it's all about, it's all about um, you know, making sure we're getting results for you guys as clients. Well, man, thanks. We're, we're at time. We try to keep it up, you know, end it at one. Um, you know, the one comment I'll leave is a great presentation and you are a smart husband. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I am. Well, well, thank you all very much for coming. Remember next week we won't have it, but we'll have it the next, uh, next week. Tony, you know, Jonathan, Justice, Christina, Sue, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful holiday and I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Yes, Appreciate you, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Miguel. Awesome. Thank you. All right.